Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Mike Samuelson. I'm a transportation planner with Minneapolis Public Works. Thank you for coming to the virtual open house for the Whittier Lindale Bikeway project. Uh, we are holding this meeting virtually rather than in person to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 per guidelines from Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, we will be recording today's presentation and question and answer and posting a video of the, the presentation on the project website. So for folks who are not able to attend today, that will be another opportunity for them to view this presentation and learn about the project. Uh, before we get going, I'm just going to introduce a couple other people who are uh, on the presentation today. First, we have uh, Abdullahi Abdule. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Abdullahi Abdule. I am a, an associate transportation planner with uh, Public Works, and I'm uh, one of the project team uh, on this project. And we also have Casey Atkins from Tool Design, who is a consultant assisting on the project. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. All right, if you can go to the next slide, please. So before we get into the topic of discussion for today, which is a transportation project, we want to just take a moment to acknowledge everything that's going on in Minneapolis, in our state, in our country, um, and to kind of help frame that, I posted, or we've posted some text from uh, the recent passage by City Council declaring racism as a public health emergency and just noted a couple of the statements uh, in that document that was approved a few weeks back. And we know there are so many emergencies happening right now. The COVID-19 pandemic, which we know is disproportionately affecting our BIPOC communities, the murder of George Floyd and subsequent uprisings, both of which happened in our streets, uh, the increase of violence that's happened this summer, uh, as well as the increase in people experiencing homelessness in our city. Uh, in addition, the rise in unemployment and looming evictions. And so none of these are specifically topics of our conversation today. Um, so the question might be, why are we bringing them up? Um, first, to just acknowledge the interconnectivity of, of the work that we're doing with the people who do live in Minneapolis uh, and many of us working on this project do live here, have family here as well. And we also just want to note that we understand that for many people, transportation is not a top priority right now. Um, and we just want to pause and, and acknowledge everything that's happening in our city um, and just sort of take a step back uh, before we get into the focus of today's conversation. So I'm going to pass it over to Abdullahi to talk a little bit more um, about the project as well as um, some of the other things going on in our city and, and how they relate to one another. Abdullahi, I think I think you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so to continue uh, this uh, where Mike left off the presentation, uh, this is a project that is focused on safety and, and also public health. But we, because of the things that Mike just listed and the things that you are all experiencing uh, this year, safety has uh, different connotations to different communities in our city. So I'd also like to, to acknowledge uh, the tremendous human suffering that is happening in our city uh, and including the murder of George Floyd and the social uprising events that followed as well as um, 
the events that were just happening last night. So this is an ongoing event. And, and when we say uh, street safety, uh, we would like to acknowledge what that means for certain uh, communities in our city. And, and we just would like to cognizant about that, it's specifically uh, trying to make our streets safer for all members of our community, specifically uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the city. Uh, with that, uh, I will get to the to the presentation. So please go to the next slide. So I and this speaks to the why we're here today. Um, and. We are here today so we can give you an update on where we are on, on the project and also discuss some of the concepts that we have developed so far uh, and then finally have some space for question and answers and also to capture your feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what are the goals of the project? This project is focusing on uh, street safety. Um, one second. One of the most important safety goals of the project is improving uh, traffic safety by reducing uh, vehicular speeds. This is particularly important because some of the segments uh, along the project corridor are currently identified as high injury streets in the city's Vision Zero program. So that it's it, the safety and reduction of speed is our priority or the, the, utmost, the number one goal of the project. The, another goal of the project is to enhance the predictability of the street for all uses by having a dedicated and protected spaces for bicyclists and motorists as well as pedestrians. So every user knows where they are supposed to be. And then another goal of the project is, is to support existing and future bicycle demand, demand by providing a major north-south bicycle connection that is comfortable, direct, and safe. And then uh, another uh, goal of the project was the fourth goal of the project is to improve the city's bicycle network connectivity. Uh, next, please. This speaks to the schedule uh, of the uh, of the project and where we are right now. So we started conducting our initial project engagement, initial project engagement in the first couple months of the year. Uh, then using the feedback and what we have heard from the community, uh, we started developing our engagement. Uh, uh, we started developing our uh, initial concepts last spring or the spring of this year. Uh, and now throughout the rest of 2020, uh, we will be conducting additional uh, engagement events so we can hear people's reactions and thoughts on the concepts and designs that we are sharing. And then so we can also make any necessary refinements. Uh, and then uh, in the upcoming winter of this year, as well as the first couple of months of, of uh, next year, uh, sometime around that time frame, we will be seeking uh, council approval uh, for the project. Next, please. This slide speaks to the safety, the core uh, project goal that I spoke to, which is that um, the map on the right shows some street segments in the in the project that are currently identified as uh, a Fission Zero streets. Uh, those are First uh, Avenue South, and then there are some segments of the the segment of 28th Street, and then Place that Avenue South. All those uh, streets are within the project corridor, and they have been identified as high injury streets. And and so we would like to we wanted to to identify that. And then the map on the left shows some of the places along the project corridor or, or project routes that have been studied that had higher speed in, uh, in, in those areas. So those are, they, they basically these speak to the project goals that we just discussed. And then the next slide uh, speaks to 
a summary of the engagement events that we have done so far. So we have wrapped up our engagement events in the first couple months of the year. Uh, and while what we were asking, so the questions that we were posing to residents and attendees that we have been engaging with were about the type of, of the, where the project should be, as well as, as well as what the project design should look like, and also some of the existing conditions that people have experienced and, and wanted to share. We attended um, or interacted with about 100 residents and business owners in four different neighborhoods. Those are Stevenson Square, uh, Whittier, Lindell, as well as Kingfield. Uh, so those were in person pre COVID and we have also designed online survey and online mapping tool where people were able to submit uh, their questions and comments uh, about along the project corridor at specific project locations. So that is some of the events that we have attended and what we uh, the information that we gathered and then the next slide is. Next slide, yeah. The, this slide speaks to some of the high points that we we have heard and the uh, that we have heard from people. Um, we heard that there was a strong desire for people to have a direct uh, uh, safe route and reduced vehicle uh, speeds. We have also, when we ask it about the type uh, of of bikeway. Uh, the opinions were were a little bit mixed. We heard two-way bikeway along First Avenue South, but we, we also heard two-way bikeway along Blaisdell Avenue South. Uh, another thing that we heard was the existing confusion and, and, and uh, our, uh, on the segment of First Avenue South that is currently two-way. The rest of First Avenue South continues to be one-way northbound, but there is a segment that that is two-way. So people had a desire to change that into a one way so the street is uh, orientation is consistent. Uh, another thing that we heard was uh, people uh, that do not typically bike wanted to see uh, their needs reflected in this in this project. And then uh, another common occurrence uh, or feedback that we heard was there were uh, of instructions on the back lane currently in the form of people that are parking on the back lane. So there was a desire to prevent that with the new backway design. And then another, the last thing that we, the last major thing that we heard from people was for this backway to be very comfortable backway that is suitable for for all uses of all ages and abilities. In other, in other words, a true to uh, all ages and abilities bikeway. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide speaks to, so this is the, the kind of an introductory to what we are proposing as the new bikeway facility, the, the, the design that we are proposing. So we are proposing two-way bikeway on First Avenue South uh, on the north end of the project. So that is from 15th Avenue uh, to 28th Street. Uh, that segment of 28 uh, First Avenue South is scheduled for full reconstruction within the next five years. So the protected backway facility that we are proposing is a bollard protected backway. And then the backway jogs into Blaisdell uh, along 28th Street, and then that would be carb separated bikeway or carb protected bikeway. And the other segment of the backway uh, would 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 stay on Blaisdell from 28th all the way to 40th Street. Uh, with those uh, bikeway types and design treatment, the one I would like to get to one of the like maybe high level reason that we got to that decision, which was uh, kind of prioritize uh, balancing some of the existing needs and and available opportunities along the project uh, uh, corridor and also where the existing trade-offs were uh, what the level of existing trade-offs were. 
Uh, the project also, besides the protected bikeway, it, it also includes pedestrian improvements at intersections. And it also includes converting First Avenue from Franklin to 28th Street into a one-way, as we have heard from, from uh, uh, residents in our uh, initial phase of engagement. Uh, I believe that next slide, Mike will, will take it from here. Great, thanks Azlahi. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some more of the design elements in detail that are proposed as part of this project. Uh, so the first slide that we have up here is just showing the two types of bikeways that are proposed. On the left, we have the curb separated bikeway that uh, would go on Blaisdell Avenue and 28th Street. And on the right is the Bollard separated bikeway that would go on First Avenue. And Abdullahi mentioned this already, but I just wanna reiterate because we've already gotten some comments asking why the difference between First Avenue and 28th Street and Blaisdell. Uh, and again, the reason for the Bollard protected bikeway on First Avenue is due to the upcoming reconstruction project uh, that's planned in a couple phases between Grant Street and Lake Street on First Ave. And so when that reconstruction project comes through, uh, it will include uh, all new sidewalk, pavement, curb and gutter, uh, and can also include an off-street bikeway, uh, like what we have uh, over on Lindale Avenue, kind of by the walker. Um, but because we have that larger investment happening in the next few years, we didn't want to go in and, and make a, a costly investment uh, with a curb-separated bikeway now, just for that work to be ripped up in a few years down the line. So um, hopefully that can answer some of the, the questions or comments we've received. And if there are other similar questions or uh, concerns or uh, that people have about the difference in the bollard versus the curb protected bikeway we can certainly uh, look to address those when we get to the q a next slide please so in addition to the protected bikeway elements we also are looking at making crossing improvements for pedestrians uh, and similar to the bikeway improvements the sections that would be on 28th and blaisdale uh, we'd be looking at making improvements with concrete. Uh, so like what we're seeing on the left, uh, a pedestrian median island. And then for the section on First Avenue, we'd be looking at quick build types of treatments uh, like what we have on the right with uh, bollards and, and other quick build elements. Next slide, please. So we've also got some questions about the route um, in particular. Why do we have uh, you know, a part of the route on First Avenue and a part of the route on Blaisdell? Uh, and there's a, a few different reasons and they're kind of illustrated on, on the slide here, but I'm gonna go into them in a little bit more detail. So the first is we're looking to address our high injury streets. Um, so portions of First and portions of Blaisdell are high injury streets, which mean they have a disproportionately high number of collisions, uh, particularly collisions that result in severe injury or fatality. Um, and so Public Works, we've really been transitioning our mission uh, for a long time. Our focus was on improving uh, mobility for people driving, reducing congestion. Uh, and in the past few years, through the adoption of our Vision Zero program, we've really shifted towards a focus on safety for people using our streets. Uh, and as part of that, we've identified high injury streets uh, like portions of First Ave and Blaisdell and looking at making safety improvements on those streets uh, within the next couple of years. And so this project would allow us to make safety improvements, not just to benefit people biking, but also people walking and driving uh, so that they can travel more safely through our city. The next item uh, or the next reason why is, uh, sorry, if we can stay on that slide, uh, is using the existing space that we have available. So on First Avenue, um, we have some, uh, we have a lightly used southbound lane on First Ave between Franklin and 28th. Um, which can be pretty easily repurposed with minimal trade-off for bikeway space. Uh, and then on Blaisdell, we already have a lot of additional space set aside for bikes. Um, and so again, it's, it's all about that kind of balance between the various transportation needs uh, within our city. And this route allows us to minimize trade-offs and to allow us to uh, have this project go forward more quickly. Um, and because we do have that space set aside, it'll, it allows us to build a wider bikeway. So along most of the corridor, we're looking at at least 12 feet of space for bikes. Um, so not only does that provide 
more space for people biking. People can ride side by side. It also makes it easier to maintain our bikeways in the winter. Uh, it's easier to get a, a plow into a wider bikeway uh, rather than a, a narrow run. Um, so that's another benefit of this route. And then lastly, um, connectivity in our bikeway network. So that was one of the goals that Abdullahi mentioned earlier. And at the northern end of the project, uh, this bikeway would be connecting into a project that's being built this year on First Avenue and Grain Street, where the construction has just started. Uh, and then at the southern end, this uh, this alignment would be closer to our uh, proposed Greenway or Bike Boulevard along Pleasant Avenue. So we feel like this gives us a little bit better bike connectivity for people continuing north or south uh, along this route. Next slide, please. So the, the next few slides are going to be mostly just pictures and images. Um, so for each section, we've got uh, an image of the existing conditions on the top, and then on the bottom is uh, an image of what the proposed project would look like. Um, just a note about the proposed project that these are images taken from other cities, so there might be some minor details. You know, the, the bike lane might be a little wider or a little narrow, narrower than what we're proposing, um, but we feel like these images do a, a good job and of sort of providing the, uh, the context and they're more illustrative than, than some of the graphics that we have available. So just to note, if, if you do want to really get into the weeds, uh, all the information on widths for uh, vehicle lanes, parking, bikeways, that's all available on our website in the initial concept. So just a quick note there. Um, so for the first section on First Ave from Franklin to 15th, um, we are looking at a bikeway uh, protected by parked vehicles. Uh, we really heard loud and clear from our initial engagement that parking was really important to residents in this area, uh, and that matches with the data that we have as well. Um, one thing that this would be doing, that the proposed project would be doing, would be to repurpose a vehicle lane uh, for space for bikes. And what we found from the, the data that we have here is that um, we had almost two thirds of vehicles on the street traveling above the speed limit. And so um, part of that is because you just have this, this really wide expanse uh, and it's the only part of Franklin in South Minneapolis that has uh, two northbound vehicle lanes right now. So by repurposing one of those lanes and, and moving that to space for bikes, um, we think we're going to see much better safety outcomes and, and less speeding. So next slide, please. And so I'm just going to focus on a few of the intersections. It's a very long project, so um, we don't have time to get through every single one. Uh, but what we can see here at Franklin and First on the left is the, the proposed uh, design. Um, and then on the right is kind of another illustrative example. So what we'd be doing here, in addition to adding the, the two-way bikeway on the left side of the street or the west side of the street, uh, we'd also be shortening uh, pedestrian exposure to vehicles on Franklin. Um, so a, a really good benefit for people crossing the street here. And you can kind of see what that would look like in the photo on the right. Next slide, please. So moving south, uh, First Avenue from Franklin to 28th. Again, this is currently a two-way section for vehicles. Um, it's the only part of First Avenue that is two-way. And so again, in, with the goal of trying to make uh, the experience for, for folks a little bit more consistent uh, and based on what we heard from users during our initial round of engagement, we'd be looking at converting this space into uh, uh, one way only for vehicles and then uh, repurposing the southbound lane that's currently there to a two-way uh, bikeway. Um, again, parking would be maintained. Uh, again, we, we heard very similar things in, in, on this part of the route in Whittier, that parking was really important for folks. So uh, we tried to be true to those comments. And next slide, please. And then uh, just an example of some of the designs that are proposed at intersections. Uh, this is First Avenue and 26th Street, so an intersection with a uh, one-way bikeway on 26th. So in addition to the crossing improvements uh, made with bollards, and you can kind of see an example of, of what that looks like from another city on the right, um, we're also looking at adding elements of a protected intersection here for bike travel, um, and also looking at the opportunity to provide some element of signal protection. And again, just because we've got a lot of bollards on the screen here, I just want to reiterate uh, the reason for the, the bollards in this section is because of the upcoming reconstruction project, um, which in this section is proposed in 2023. 
Next slide, please. So for the short stretch on 28th Street, um, as you can see from, from the images here, the cross section would be pretty similar to what we see today. We would still be maintaining parking on the north side of the street. Um, currently, because of the, the Lake Street reconstruction, for folks who are familiar with the section of 28th, uh, you, you know that parking has been temporarily removed uh, to accommodate a bus lane. But once Lake Street reconstruction is done, um, we would go back to, to what we have here, which is parking, um, a couple lanes of traffic. Uh, we will be narrowing our, our vehicle lanes again to reduce speeding and then converting the existing one-way bollard protected bikeway to a two-way curb protected bikeway. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here we're showing Blaisdell and 28th. So this is one of the locations where uh, the bikeway would be turning 90 degrees. Um, and we can see here some of the concrete elements that will both serve as protection for people biking, excuse me, as well as shortening the crossing distance for pedestrians. And a pretty similar example on the right. Next slide. And so just a couple more segments to go. Uh, we do have a short segment on Blaisdell uh, between 28th and 31st, where there are currently two lanes of traffic. Um, that will largely remain the same. Again, we'll be looking at opportunities to narrow lane widths, um, but keeping the two lanes of traffic, largely keeping parking in place. Uh, the block on Blaisdell between 28th and 29th Street is the one block where we're currently proposing to remove parking. Um, and that's just, again, thinking about the, the balances and trade-offs to accommodate uh, the bikeway on Blaisdell um, and also thinking about, you know, congestion. Uh, so this is the one location where we would be proposing to remove the full block of parking between 28th and 29th. Um, south of 29th from 29th to 31st, parking would largely remain as it is today. Next slide. And so at the intersection of Blaisdell and Lake uh, is the one location where uh, we're dealing with high volume bus traffic. And so what we're proposing here is a, uh, a raised bikeway um, where the bikeway sidewalk and bus stop would all be at the same level. Uh, and it would end up looking pretty similar to what's at Lindale and Groveland Avenue, uh, which is the photo on the right. Um, so for folks who uh, want something a little more tactile or be able to go check that out, that's a, a pretty good representation of what we're proposing here. Um, so in addition to the improvements for bikes uh, and accommodating and, and working with Metro Transit on bus access, we'd also be shorting, shortening uh, the crossing distance for pedestrians. Next slide, please. And so our, our southernmost section, uh, Blaisdell currently has a Bollard protected one-way bikeway on the right side or the west side of the street. Um, we'd be looking at uh, largely maintaining parking here, having a, a single uh, southbound vehicle lane, and then uh, upgrading our bikeway from a one-way bollard protected bikeway to a two-way curb protected bikeway. And next slide, please. And then for our signalized intersections in this section, 35th Street, uh, 36th Street, and 38th, the design's all pretty similar. Um, where we'd be looking at adding a dedicated right turn lane uh, and again looking for opportunities to provide signal protection um, between people making that southbound right turn across the bikeway and people biking uh, to provide not just separation with space but also separation in time uh, and then on the south side shortening crossings for pedestrians. And so if we can go to the last slide um, I'll just keep this up here for for a moment. I know that was a lot of information and we'll have time to get to Q and A's uh, in a moment, but there is uh, an online survey and wiki mapping tool on the project website, which is shown here. Uh, we know it's difficult during COVID uh, when we're not able to do in-person events uh, to provide feedback. So we're, we're looking to provide other opportunities as well uh, via phone or text, uh, as well as email. So if, if you know people who weren't able to attend tonight's meeting, um, they're certainly welcome to call, text, or email uh, the information on the screen. And then if they have a comment to submit, we can take that. If they have questions and want to discuss, uh, we can certainly discuss via those, those avenues. So that concludes the presentation part of tonight.
Uh, I know we've been getting some questions coming in, uh, and I think Abdullahi's uh, going to be moderating the chat, uh, and then uh, myself and, and Casey Atkins from Tool are going to be responding to questions. So thanks for submitting questions. If you have additional, you can continue to submit those during the Q&A uh, through the chat box on, I believe, the right side of your screen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. The, the first, first question, question is for you. you. Why is the jog? Uh, why is the jog in the route necessary if one of the main goals is a direct route? I would strongly prefer a route all the way down Blaisdell rather than having it jog over to first. So we we touched on this a little bit um, previously. Uh, some of the the trade-offs and the balances that, that we had. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about to just sort of add a little bit more detail in the answer to this question is um, the, the streets kind of further south on First Avenue and further north on Blaisdell. Um, so if we, once you get south of, um, of 31st Street on First Avenue, the street starts to narrow a lot uh, and it would just not provide us as much space for a bikeway. Um, we'd be looking at you know something closer to uh, eight feet rather than the the twelve feet that we have on most of the route that we have today. So again, that was one of the considerations that we made. Uh, and then as you go up uh, Blaisdell and then up into La Salle, you uh, you have some other trade-offs with again high parking demand, uh, congestion, and then there's also not a connection back to our protected bikeway network. Um, so again, thinking about the network connectivity, that was part of the goal of this project. So, um, you know, I think we've we've touched on this quite a bit, and so I don't know if I have a whole lot to add, but I'd say just to sort of summarize, um, there were some technical aspects and then some sort of balancing of the various transportation priorities uh, that we have. Thanks, Mike. The next question is, is also for you. Blaisdell is residential street. If this project hopes to reduce vehicle speeding and improve pedestrian safety, why doesn't this design address the double threat crossing situation that thre threatens people walking between downtown and first street? Um, so it sounds like this question is about uh, Blaisdell in downtown or maybe further north. Um, than our than our project currently includes. Um, I will just say that uh, Abdullahi and I are actually also working on a project with the Whittier Elementary School to improve crossing safety at Blaisdell and 25th. Um, but more generally, you know, I think we uh, we're first to make decisions about where to um, where to include uh, projects, and we do that through our 20-year streets funding plan, which was passed by council. Um, which includes a, uh, a racial and economic equity lens, as well as looking at street users um, to help prioritize our goals. And so, you know, as part of this project, um, portions north of Blaisdell uh, aren't included for some of the reasons that we, we talked about previously. Um, and we are looking to get to particularly the, the portions of Blaisdell that we're not able to get to here that are on the high injury network through our Vision Zero uh, program. Thanks, Mike. This is also multi-layered uh, question. Are there any design features that will allow the bollard protected sections to successfully keep cars from parking in the bike lane? What is the distance between bollards? Uh, I feel our current bollard protected bike lanes are too often used for car parking and end up uh, discouraging bicycle, bicycle use. Yeah, that, so we did get comments about um, vehicles blocking uh, blocking the bikeway uh, and something that on the curb protected section we are addressing with the, the implement, implementation of curbs. Um, for the bollard protected section uh, for the next few years, uh, obviously we would have bollards there and you know we're looking at finding kind of the, 
the appropriate spacing distance to minimize or discourage or you know eliminate um, vehicles from blocking those bikeways. And uh, Casey, I'll kind of put you on the spot. I'm not sure if Tool has any thoughts or best practices on bollard spacing to discourage that kind of behavior. Yeah, um, a lot of the national best practice is going to be spacing between 10 and 40 feet. Um, typically in Minneapolis, the spacing is about 30 feet, and you'll notice actually on the layout that's provided on the website, um, in those locations where we do have parking adjacent to the bikeway, we're actually proposing and having discussions around um, shortening up that baller distance to um, really try to prevent people from parking in there. Um, it, it isn't a perfect and magic answer, um, but if we're able to get a few more ballers in there, then hopefully we'll deter more people from getting in there. And then as more bicyclists use the route as well, uh, motorists will definitely identify, hey, this is not a space I am supposed to be. So, um, and that'll grow as the bike volumes also grow once the route is in place. All right, uh, thank you both. This next question is also, I believe, for Mike. Um, the first part of his comment, uh, I think this is a good step in the right direction. Thanks. Um, well, thank you. If if I'm understanding correctly, this the the intention is to upgrade the route to a carb separated bikeway after the street after the street is reconstructed in a few years. Can this be stated within the plan? I'm concerned that the route will never be upgraded. Mike. Yeah, um, good question. So, you know, as we go through with street reconstructions, those have their own uh, engagement processes, those have their own um, design processes. So we, we wouldn't necessarily be able to say with 100% certainty that this street would be upgraded. Um, with that being said, uh, the street is identified, First Avenue is identified uh, in our draft transportation action plan as a bikeway, um, as part of our AAA network, as a protected bikeway. Um, and you know, the, the idea would be kind of using these couple years as a pilot um, to identify design elements that work well. And then once the street is reconstructed, we can implement those in a more permanent fashion. Um, as far as the, the timing of those reconstructions, you know, we feel um, pretty confident that the street will be reconstructed soon with COVID and impacts on the city budget. We're still waiting to see how that will, will shake out. But at this point, we're looking at the first phase of that reconstruction happening in 2023, and then the second phase happening in 2025. Thanks, Mike. The next question is also for you. Most questions are for Mike today. How can this project also add more reduced speed elements for cars since that would address the first priority of the plan to reduce injuries and reduce the speed. So we've got a couple primary tools that we're using to reduce speed. Um, the first is narrowing our vehicle lanes. And so there's, there's a lot of good research that's out there um, that talks about the impacts on vehicle speed when you narrow lanes. And that's something that we're looking to do uh, pretty uniformly along this project. The second is some of the intersection improvements that we're making. Um, things like bump outs or protected intersections, um, which discourage vehicles from turning too quickly uh, at intersections. And we know that most of our collisions in Minneapolis do happen at intersections, uh, and especially um, with pedestrians and um, people riding bikes who are you know, often our most vulnerable users. Um, so as far as safety upgrades, those are uh, two that we've, we've used elsewhere and we've seen used effectively in other parts of the country to improve safety. Um, I'll turn it over to Casey just to see if you have anything to, to add here. The only other thing I would add is um, with the presence of the vertical curb, as well as those ballers along the roadway, that's going to add vertical friction along the roadway that will also naturally slow people down. So um, you'll notice if you drive down a street that's got a lot of street trees or even just parked vehicles, that can also work as vertical friction and people tend to drive a lot slower in that regard. Other than that, Mike covered all of the other options. 
or that we're, we're, we're planning to implement right now. The, so the next question is a follow up to the original question that I was asking, why the jack uh, between Blaisdell and first and not stay all the way uh, on Blaisdell. So the follow up is this, why can't we remove one travel lane on the north, northern portion of Blaisdell to allow uh, one continuous route? Uh, Mike, I believe this is for you as well. So we, we did look at that option um, and working with some of our public works colleagues um, to try and identify kind of what that would mean uh, from a holistic transportation standpoint. Um, we did look at it, it was considered and, and just eventually um, we went with the decision to, to go with the route that's proposed. Um, in addition to, to the the issues on, on Blaisdell, just in, as far as kind of how we're going to allocate space there, and I think I mentioned this earlier, but you know, network connectivity was, was a really important one for this project. And just the, the northern part of our network, uh, as is being constructed right now, is on First Avenue. Um, and so we are looking at ways to connect up with First Avenue. And so you know, whether you, uh, you make that jog further north um, you know, at, at 15th Street, uh, where you could then go all the way down Blaisdell, you're, you're still making a, a jog in one way or the other. So um, if we if we were going to use Blaisdell, um, there, you know, essentially they just sort of would have had to have been a, a jog at some point. And we felt like with the other factors in the project, uh, the space available on 1st, the space available on 28th, uh, it just made sense to, to do it there. Thank you, Mike. Um, this question is, I believe, for you, but Casey, please uh, chime in if you feel like uh, you have something to add. Um, on Blaisdell intersection, on Blaisdell intersections that will lose parking lanes very fast, uh, traffic will come very close to the curb and residences. I worry this will have final in effect, forcing cars to slightly turn twice while going through the intersections and bringing cars dangerously close to the sidewalk, even if just for a small portion. I, or that might be just a comment. Any, anything that you, both of you, like any of you would like to say? Sure. Um, so the, I think the portion that's being discussed is uh, between 28th and 29th, where we mentioned the projects proposing to remove parking. Um, that land use on, on the side where parking would be removed is uh, it's adjacent to the Whittier Clinic uh, and right now it's just adjacent to a parking lot. So uh, we know that there, there are some people who certainly walk along Blaisdell there uh, and it may be a little bit less comfortable um, in the future, but as far as impacts on, on land use, we think those are going to be pretty minimal and um, I've had some good conversations with staff at the clinic. Um, so they're aware of the project and, and as far as I can tell, support it. Thank you, Mike. We got two more questions. The next one is any planned raised or table crosswalks? And that's Mike or Casey. Uh, not as part of this project right now, I think, because those, those types of improvements tend to be uh, involved as, as part of a reconstruct. So there's potential we could see something like that as part of the First Avenue reconstruction that happens in a couple years. Uh, thank you. The This one is asking for clarification. Do bollards here refer to plastic flex, uh, flex posts? Is infrastructure that offers more protection being considered? Mike. Yeah, so when we're talking about bollards, we're talking about plastic flex posts. Um, in this area, 26th Street and 28th Street are pretty good examples of, of that type of product. Um, what we have started doing in some other locations uh, and what we're looking at doing here is providing, and Casey, you might have to help me out on some of the technical terms, but I think it's called a FG50. It's, it's essentially sort of a series of bollards that are very closely spaced together with kind of a, a base. And I know we've, we've installed those um, on the U of M bikeway. And I don't know, Casey, if you can just talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, so these 
as Mike mentioned, they are very closely spaced and they're actually on a little plastic base um, that screws into the roadway. And so we've actually identified locations, particularly near the intersections to um, number one, reduce turning speeds as people are making those turns. Um, but also just to really clarify that this is the bikeway uh, when you're in that location. So some of the things with the design at the intersections, when we could, we bent that bikeway out in order to give people good, um, good sight to a biker crossing the roadway. But in addition, there'll be that visual cue of those closely spaced flex posts um, that says, hey, this is an intersection here, don't invade this space. And that'll that'll hopefully also prevent people from driving in the bikeway as well, um, because in some instances it might look like a drive lane with the width. Thank you, Casey and uh, Mike. We actually got a couple more questions. Um, next one is a couple of times during the presentation, you have mentioned that the proposed bikeway is wide. I think it is much too narrow. There are five foot wide sections proposed. Is there room to widen the bikeways to at least seven to eight feet wide in each section by narrowing the buffer and reducing travel and parking lane widths? Uh, either of you can, can answer that. So I'll, I'll just say that um, we I did see this comment that came in uh, through some of our online surveys and that you know we are looking at opportunities to adjust buffer width in particular um, to provide a little bit more space to the bikeway. Uh, Casey, I don't know if you have anything else to add just from a sort of a technical point just to sort of discuss the widths. Yeah, one of the things when we first started looking at this project was trying to see if there might be opportunities along the corridor to try to incorporate some green infrastructure or trees or just green versus having everything be concrete out there. Um, so that's why you're seeing some of those wider buffer widths um, when it came to reallocating the space within the roadway. And as we work through the design and some, whether whether green infrastructure is a reality, depending on utilities and things underneath the roadway, um, some of that that might be able to change as we move forward into final design. Thank you both. The next question reads this. I currently live on 3500 Blaisdell and this section is heavily traveled by the fire department and EMS and other drivers uh, typically pull over into the bike lane, uh, but car protected bikeway will eliminate this possibility. Will emergency routes change or prioritize the streets over Blaisdell? Uh, Mike. So we've, we've had some uh, initial conversations with the fire department and we've shared this design with, with uh, the assistant chief over there, just talking about access to and from their station. And we know that there's a couple of fire stations um, near our route, one at uh, 15th and 1st, and then one at 28th and Blaisdell. So we do wanna be very cognizant of emergency response. Uh, and we're working closely with the fire department to make sure that um, whatever we build not only meets our transportation goals, but also uh, allows them to do their important jobs. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the next question can be either of you. Winter and it's about winter maintenance. Can you describe any changes here with the protected intersections and carps? I can start and talk more um, locally and then Casey, if you want to kind of fill in um, kind of more general best practices. So one of the, the benefits of the two way wider bikeway is it allows our maintenance team to uh, perform winter plowing more quickly than um, than with a narrower one way bikeway. So um, if the bikeway is uh, eight feet wide or more, or I'm sorry, eight and a half feet wide or more, uh, that allows us to use a pickup truck, which can get to our bikeways faster. If it's a narrower bikeway, we have to use a little bobcat and that has to be kind of uh, carried around. So um, that is one of the benefits of the, the wider bikeway that we're showing here. Um, we're working with our maintenance team in Public Works to ensure that whatever we put out is compatible with the equipment that we have and um, that it can be maintained and plowed quickly. Um, that is one of the big benefits we see of this project, particularly on First Avenue, is allowing for much easier uh, and safer winter riding because currently on First, 
you have a striped only bike lane, um, which isn't plowed in the winter. And we often see a lot of snow and ice build up there, uh, whereas the, the separated bikeway will be plowed uh, and, maintain, and maintained in the winter. And Casey, I'm not sure if you have anything to add on a kind of a, a bigger scale. No, you got it. Great. Ab Abdullah here, I think you're muted. My bad, thank you, thank you. Uh, we we have a follow up question to one of the questions that was asked before. So the question that I was asking about place still intersections, uh, loose parking lanes, and the, there's a I'll, I'll just read that first question because it's a long question and then I'll read the, the follow up. So the first the original question read on place still intersections that will lose parking lanes very fast, consistently speeding traffic will come very close to the curb and residences. I worry this will have a final effect forcing cars to slightly turn uh, open brackets uh, twice while going through the intersections and then close brackets and bring cars dangerously close to the sidewalk even if it is just for a small portion. The follow up question is they they were the close to the car question was referring to Blaisdell and 35th and 36th uh, intersections. So I don't know if, if you have anything to add or, or clarify Mike uh, to the answer that you've given. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you for, for clarifying that question. So with the design that we have, uh, it does include some amount of lateral shift at these intersections. Um, and, you know, in addition to providing space for bikes and space for right turns there, um, the, the other goal of lateral shifts is, is to help encourage vehicles to travel more slowly as they approach the intersection. Um, I will just note that um, at these locations, there is a turning lane that's adjacent to the curb right now, so we will see some changes um, with the striping compared to what's out there today. Um, but there also be a lot of a lot of consistencies with what's there now. And uh, Casey, I'm not sure if you have anything to add just as far as from an engineering perspective uh, on this design and, and the question that was asked. Yeah. Um, next to the through motor vehicle travel lane, um, I believe that's kind of more where you're referring to. Something to note is that in the city, there are restrictions on parking near the intersection. So even though there might not be a designated turn there today, or even if there is, um, motorists are likely using that space to make that turn and are already close to that, that location. Um, as Mike mentioned, having that shift will really encourage people to slow down and then also having them align directly across as directly across the intersection as we can helps make sure that they stay in their lane and know where they should be. Um, it's so the operation is really not a whole lot different than it is today, other than maybe you have a parked vehicle on the other side of the road. But even then, at that point, that vehicle should also be a certain distance away from the curb, if you will. So in theory, a vehicle might be able to turn into that space. Um, so hopefully that that answers your question there. If, if, if it's regarding the other side, um, the west side of Blaisdell, what we're implementing there are those um, what we're referring to as those protected intersections. So that would be the concrete curb with that kind of concrete little median island that you see. And that is designed um, specifically to slow motorists making turns down. And then what it also does is it allows those motorists to make their turn. They can look and see not only people biking, but also people walking across the street and yield um, also with their trunk a bit out of traffic, so they're not as worried about being rear-ended and um, their their likelihood of yielding to both bicyclists and pedestrians uh, will increase. Thank you, Casey and Mike. The last question that we have, uh, and we apologize if we haven't if we missed this question before, uh, if one of the goals is to uh, improve bicycle network connectivity, why isn't there a protected connection from the Greenway to this planned protected route? Mike. Mike, you're muted. Thank you. So this project does, uh, it is proposing a connection between the Greenway and Blaisdell. Uh, 
and it would be a, again a two-way protected bikeway uh, on the south side of, of 29th Street. Um, we know that with uh, with the city re recently purchasing the Kmart site, um, that there's going to be a lot of planning and engagement efforts around that site in the future. Um, and so, again, this is kind of meant to be something that can be implemented quickly, uh, and then in the next year, uh, that would provide a connection between the Greenway and between this new project. And then uh, as the city increases its engagement efforts around the, the Kmart site, um, you know, that connection may, may evolve. I believe that is all of the questions that we've received so far. If there are any other questions that you think about after this uh, event or uh, after you can send those to us uh, to the project website. Um, Mike, any 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 final com uh, closing comments? Or any other uh, Casey as well? No, thanks everyone for attending uh, and we appreciate the questions and uh, we've brought up the project website and contact information. So uh, please don't be shy about following up if you have additional questions or comments. And thanks again for attending. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.